Hello world, my name is Victor Engelmann. Welcome back to this video series about professional network design using Linux. Today I want to configure a DHCP server, which yeah, is just a server that uh, yeah, basically configures the rest of your network. Um, it gives devices IP addresses, subnet masks, um, router addresses, stuff like that. And um, yeah, it's a, a good thing to have that so that you don't have to do these things manually. And yeah, that's what we will do today. Um, this is pretty straightforward because of that. I'm again not doing anything on the whiteboard. So yeah, let's just dive right in. Um, before we start, I want to point out one thing. Um, the Raspberry that is going to run the DHCP server is plugged in on port 3 on this switch here. And I have taken this out of VLAN 1. Okay, so VLAN 1, port 3 is not a member. So that um, this DHCP server doesn't receive DHCP requests from VLAN 1 because uh, yeah, I have some devices in there and I don't want to misconfigure them through this uh, DHCP server. Okay, now let's install the server here. The package is called isc dash dhcp dash server. Okay, and we immediately get the first uh, problem because the installer tries to start the DHCP server, but yeah, the default uh, configuration that you get here just doesn't work. Um, as it says here, we can ask journal control dash xe. Okay. Does it give us any good information here? It says no subnet declaration for ETH zero. So far ten one two one hundred and yeah, that's really the point in uh, in the default configuration. So let's look into dhcpd.conf. So uh, what this what this error message means is that. Uh, the DHCP server doesn't have any range to serve to its clients yet. As you can see down here, all the ranges here that uh, it might um, serve are just all commented out. There's just nothing to do for it. And because of that, it just exits with an error. So yeah, let's just change that directly. Maybe take this entry here. So the first thing we need is an entry for the network that the Raspberry itself is running in. So 10.1.2.0 with a network mask of 255, 255, 255, 0, 24 net mask. Normally you should leave some room for some static IP addresses. So you might set this to start at 10.1.2.20 and go to 10.1.2.200 maybe. Um, so that you have a bit of uh, space before and after the range for some static IP addresses. Now the domain name server is ns1.engelman.local. Um, now this actually doesn't really make sense because um, 
this is a host name and to resolve the host name we need this server that we are trying to set but uh, yeah that's a little trick in the um, implementation of this DHCP server you can put a host name here then the DHCP server will resolve that host name to 10.1.2.100 and yeah then this um, IP address will be served to the clients okay good now we can set a domain name just like we did here you now here we set the primary search domain here we can do that also the router is 10 1 2 254. The broadcast address is just an entry in the ARP table. Typically this would be the last address in that uh, range. So, so we would set this to 10.1.2.255 and that just means that the clients will get an entry in their ARP table for the address 10.1.2.255 with the MAC address FFFF, FF, 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 um, yeah, which is the broadcast address. So when you send something there, it just gets broadcasted by the network infrastructure. Okay, default lease time and max lease time, 10 minutes and two hours. They specify how long a client will be allowed to keep the IP address you gave it. and yeah, after I think half the uh, maximum lease time, it will just tell the DHCP server, hey, I still have this and renew the, the lease time. So, um, and this is really a matter of taste. You can set this to more, you can set it to less. Um, it depends on your scenario. You know, if you're running, a, I don't know, a restaurant with an open Wi-Fi, then you might want to set this to a shorter time um, because yeah, people typically won't stay there very long and you want the IP addresses to be taken back so they can be given to other people. Um, but uh, yeah, that's also additional, um, that also causes additional traffic and um, yeah, I think it's a better idea to, uh, to increase this I think a week would actually be okay, but anyhow, I set this to one hour and two hours respectively. Okay. Up here you can uh, set the default values for these um, because you can have multiple ranges down here but uh, yeah here up here you can set the default values now separated with a comma you could add another DNS server you know we had this example with ns1.something.local if we had a failover server in a different company, you know, we discussed this topic, but yeah, I physically only have this one server, so I will set this to only this one. Okay. And I might want to set this to authoritative. So basically this says, hey, I'm the main um, DHCP server for this network. This might help with uh, rogue DHCP servers, but uh, yeah, anyhow, I'll, I'll put it in here, but I don't think it actually has any uh, effect. Uh, one more thing I want to configure, option NTP server 10.1.2.255. Okay, now let's try
Yeah, okay. <laughs> I know what's going on. Um, I've created a subnet, but the problem is that um, I haven't told the server to use uh, the ETH0 interface for this. It's the default ISC DHCP server interfaces v4 eth0 okay now let's try again okay this looks stupid okay i'm rebooting this thing it, uh, apparently it uh, didn't understand that the dhcp server wasn't running before I don't know. Okay, now it's running. So, okay, now we have a DHCP server and yeah, let's try using that. Set this to automatic. Okay. address is now <laughs> 101221 um, okay so you see I have gotten an IP address subnet mask broadcast address and if I can ping 8888 yeah that means I have also gotten a working router um, Good. Now, sometimes you want devices to always have the same IP address. Uh, for example, if it, maybe it's running some server and some client cannot resolve host names, so uh, you have to configure the IP address in the client. You know, uh, industrial machines sometimes uh, can only take IP addresses and no host names, for example, and. Uh, yeah, for such a situation, I will copy the MAC address here. And here back in our DHCPD conf, you can now go into the subnet and put an entry host. I call this one laptop because it's for this laptop. And you have to put hardware ethernet, put the, IP, uh, the MAC address here. Then you can set fixed address, let's say 101221 is my current IP address. So I will keep this now. And uh, yeah, you could also uh, put some other options here, like uh, option host name foobar to rename uh, the entry here. But uh, I will leave this out. Okay. Maybe I should have given it a different uh, IP address. Let's give it, I don't know, 42. We start again.
Okay, connection activated. Sounds good. Because that probably means that I have gotten an IP address. And yeah, now my IP address is 101242. So that is good. Now for this assignment of these um, options here, as I told you, you can also set other options and uh, you can set options up here, right? Um, yeah, there's a lot of options that you can set. You can Google for DHCP dash options. It's, that has its own man page uh, just with these options here. And yeah, there's really a lot of options that you can set. Um, here, for example, host name, um, IP forwarding, MTU, uh, an IRC server for some reason. Doesn't really make sense to me, but uh, a log server. Uh, what else can you set down here? It's uh, as, as I told you, an NTP server can be set. You see, that's, that's here. Yeah, anyhow, uh, if you want to, uh, to know what options you can set through DHCP, as I said, uh, Google for DHCP dash options. But there's one thing I want to point out uh, right up here. You can see uh, that you can actually even use expressions which means that this assignment of things like a host name, for example, are a bit programmable. Like this code here, for example, takes the MAC address and turns that into the host name. Okay, that's, that's an interesting thing if you ask me. It uh, allows you to give uh, yeah, the MAC addresses as host names. And if you want to know more about that, there's yet another <laughs> man page, dhcp-eval, which has uh, some more information about this. This programmability is limited, okay? So it's mostly some string operations like uh, taking substrings and suffixes, uppercase, lowercase. Um, the client can send options in the DHCP request already and um, you can uh, look at these options here using this option option name. So for example, the host name um, is something that the client sends as an option. And so you could, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, concatenate, see concat, um, the host name that you got from the client with the MAC address or something like that that should work. Uh, you can also call uh, a few functions like log to write something to the log and uh, you can execute external programs. Um, but yeah, as I said, this is relatively limited. Um, you can use some if, else, if, else logic here, for example. Um, to set uh, values depending on some Boolean expressions. This Boolean expressions can be combined with AND or NOT. You can ask if options are present or not. Um, yeah. Uh, one thing I want to show you here is, um, this is a bit ugly, but uh, there is a way to assign IP addresses just based on the host name and uh, that's, uh, I found that here on uh, pullsecure.net. Um, so what they do here is they take the option hostname and if that is this or that value, then we have a match which puts the, uh, the machine into this class. And then down here, you can then assign uh, to the members of that class uh, a value from this range which just contains the same IP address twice 
So uh, that effectively gives them a fixed IP address. Yeah, not really an elegant solution, but uh, I still wanted to show it to you. Okay, um, one thing I want to show you, it's not that important, I just want to mention it, is the file var lib dhcp dhcpd.leases, which yeah, contains the active leases that ISC has given out. Okay, and uh, yeah, some information related to that, for example, how long it's going to be valid and stuff like that. Um, hardware address, host name. Interestingly, it has given an IP address to the netcore. That's strange. The netcore is uh, configured statically, I think, but anyhow, um, there's 21 but uh, there's no uh, lease for the 42 because yeah, that's a reserved address, that's not a lease. So yeah, that's why that's not in this file. But there's also a tool, DHCP lease list, which uh, gives you the same information, a bit more compact and uh, yeah. Okay, so this is how you can see your current leases. Okay, so now that we have a running DHCP server, um, yeah, the next thing you want to do is make it fail safe. So, fail safety is always done with redundancy, so we need a second DHCP server. And yeah, this time I don't want to show this only in theory, I really want to do it. And uh, yeah, I've prepared yet another. Raspberry Pi for this. So here you can see the switch that it's connected to. It's connected on port 3, which I have put in uh, VLAN 2, just as the other DHCP server. And um, yeah, if you look at VLAN 2, um, port 3 is untagged and VLAN 1 Port 3 is not a member, just like with the primary DHCP server. I have given that Raspberry the IP address 10.1.2.101, so we can now connect to it, SSH pi at 10.1.2.101. Okay, there we are. And let's also connect to the primary DHCP server. Okay, um, before I proceed, I want to show you that um, I have done a little bit on the DNS server. Specifically, since the uh, DHCP server itself is in VLAN 2, I have allowed 127.0.0.1 as a client in VLAN 2 so that the uh, Raspberry can use itself as a DNS server. And I've also made 127.0.0.1 trusted so that it is also allowed to connect to itself. Okay. And uh, yeah, I needed to do that because, um, yeah, I have um, created entries in my zone file here for DHCP and DHCP2 for the primary and secondary DHCP servers. And uh, yeah, I want to reference these uh, servers in the DHCP configuration uh, using these host names. So therefore the DHCP server needed to use itself as a DNS server because uh, yeah, my Fritzbox doesn't have these entries. 
Okay. Um, good. Now to um, to create a failover. Um, first, yeah, on the failover we also need to install ISC. We are getting the same problem as before. The DHCP server refuses to start. problem we don't have a subnet declaration again just the same problem that we had with the primary DHCP server so we need to configure it to actually work so we need to set an interface for it to use th0 as a starting point I would just copy the configuration from the primary DHCP server so let's just say sudo cut etsy dhcp hcpd.conf Do we configure this to use failover now? Well, you can just Google for ISC DHCP failover, and yeah, the first result is already what we are looking for. This is the official documentation of ISC, and yeah, it basically tells you to copy this part here in the configuration on the primary server this part into the configuration of the secondary server. Okay, so let's do this. Copy this to the primary DHCP server. So here we declare a failover peer. I'll call it maybe DHCP2. So we are saying I'm the primary one. My address is dhcp.engelmann.local. For this to work, I needed to set uh, the Raspberry as DNS server for itself. That's uh, why I had to reconfigure the DNS server a little bit. And the peer is dhcp2.engelmann.local. So the primary one will communicate on port 519 and the secondary on 520. Yeah, a few uh, configuration options to, um, to control something like how long will it take until one of the servers considers the other one to be down and take over? Okay, but uh, yeah, I don't want to go into that. So what we now need to do is we need to, uh, to tell our subnet to use this failover peer. In that help page, they 
put this in a separate pool. So let's do that also. Um, one thing I want to point out here is um, you can configure multiple peers here and you can declare yourself primary for some of these and you can declare yourself uh, secondary for others and um, yeah, then you can have these failover relationships um, with different configurations. Okay, so I could now configure a, another subnet uh, with a different failover that where I have configured myself to be a secondary failover. So uh, this is again useful in situations where you have two companies, two DHCP servers, each one has one. And uh, then you can be the primary server for your own um, IP ranges and secondary for the other company's IP ranges. Uh, and vice versa. So, so then you would have your own IP range here, configure a failover peer where you are primary, and the remote IP range uh, would be another subnet configuration where you would have a different uh, failover peer where you are secondary. Okay. Good. Um, Okay, now let's configure the secondary server. Here we copy the declaration for the secondary. So my failover peer is DHCP. Maybe I could call it DHCP1, but whatever. So my own address is dhcp2.engelmann.local. The peer address is dhcp.engelmann.local. And notice that the ports are reversed here. Here our local port is 520 and the remote port is 519. And here we have a few less configuration options. Okay, and now let's put this also in a pool. And configure the failover up here. DHCP1. Save. Now, at this point, this should already work. Um, but yeah, this is for professional network design. And yeah, in a professional environment, we want everything to be secure. So uh, we will now implement a, an authorization method, OM API. But uh, I want to point out this OM API is only there to authorize an access to the server. So you will have a shared secret. So both ends have the same uh, uh, the same password, and yeah, that is used to sign the data that is uh, coming in. But that doesn't mean the data was encrypted. Therefore, you really should only use this through a local network or an encrypted tunnel like a VPN, because uh, yeah, this uh, communication is still unencrypted. It's only signed. So um, yeah. this configuration over here. 
Um, I think it should also be possible to put that into this failover up here block over there so that you can use different configurations for different failover peers, but anyhow. Um, here we declare a, an encryption key called OMAPI key and up here we tell it to use that key. Again, I think if we move this part into this failover block here, I think we can then use different keys for different connections, but uh, anyhow, I will use it like this now. Using algorithm hmacmd 5 might not be the best idea, but um, yeah. Here we need to specify some password. I would advise you to go to something like random.org. Um, lists and more passwords. Generate one password of length 24. That's the longest you can set here. And get passwords. Okay. Here I now have a password and I will paste this here. And I need to also paste this whole thing here. Okay, the same setting. The secret need to match. Uses symmetric encryption apparently, which is not really great, but uh, yeah, as long as you transfer the uh, the key through an encrypted tunnel like SSH, I think we are good. So, so okay, let's see. This looks good. So let's see if this works. This looks good. No error message. Okay, it says it's running. Yeah, the communication probably doesn't work yet, so uh, I need to restart the server over here also. failover peer DHCP1. I move from recover to startup. Um, this is what it does when it says that um, the failover or the, the primary one is, um, is missing. The connection failed. Unknown failover relationship name. Um, Let's see, maybe they need to have the same name here.
okay. Um, it says the service is already running, so it complains about the file var run dhcpd.pit already existing. So, yeah, to uh, fix this, we could reboot the um, the secondary server, but I think it should be enough to just remove that file. Yeah, now it doesn't complain anymore. Now let's see what happens if we look at the status. Failover peer Engelmann, yeah, this looks better. So it has found the failover peer the secondary server moves from uh, recover to recover done. Peer update completed, move from recover to recover done. Recover done to normal, both servers normal. This is what I want to see, okay? And here it now synchronizes with the primary server. Um, there are 181 addresses between uh, 10, 1, 2, 20 and 10, 1, 2, 200. Um, yeah, 181 addresses in that range. One of them is taken for the laptop and uh, this means that 180 are free. Okay, failover Pierre Engelmann, both uh, peer moves from recover done to normal, both servers normal, yes. The primary server also agrees that uh, uh, that everything is good. So let's see. On my laptop, IPA will show us my current IP address. Oh, my wireless LAN seems to be connected. I don't want that to be the case because I don't want the configuration of the wireless LAN to uh, to interfere with the connections uh, that I'm deliberately configuring here. Okay, so 10.1.2.42 is my IP address, right? So now I will disconnect myself from the uh, wired network. Wait a few seconds. Okay, connection is deactivated. So if I now look at my IP address again, I don't have an IP address anymore. If I reconnect now, it says it's uh, activated again, and I have, well, the same IP address again, and I can 8888 for example yes so the configuration that I've got is good now to test the failover yeah let's just keep running um, now I will shut down the service on the primary DHCP server okay Okay, peer has disconnected, failover peer Engelmann. I move from normal to communications interrupted. Okay, so the failover now has taken over control of the network. And if I now disconnect, Again, have no IP address. Now remember the primary DHCP server isn't running at this point so if I plug in again now um, I can only get an address from the secondary server and yeah this looks good it tells me uh, that the connection was activated I have an IP address and I can ping 8888 so 
So yeah, this means that the failover is working. And if I start the primary DHCP server again, yeah, it uh, notices that uh, both servers are normal again. I move from communication interrupted to normal. It synchronizes again and everything is good. Yeah, this is how you do uh, a failover so that you have two DHCP servers which work together with each other and don't disturb each other. And then you have redundancy and redundancy gives you fail safety. Now the dhcpd.conf on the primary and secondary uh, DHCP server are really very similar to each other, right? If you look at it, um, these subnets here are exactly the same. So I'm switching back and forth between the two windows here. And uh, yeah, everything here is the same except this uh, setting that says, hey, I'm the primary DHCP server and here the failover peer setting says I'm the secondary server. So um, something that you might want to do is you could just take these failover peer settings and move them to a different file, like maybe let's see DHCP um, failover peer.conf or something like that. And then you can include that file here and remove the data here from this file. And then both files are completely identical. They just include different files, but uh, well, these files should then be in the same location on both servers. But um, yeah, that would have then the advantage that you can synchronize your primary and secondary server just by copying this DHCPD conf. Okay. So the difference between these files is then moved to a different file on both sides. Okay, now let's think about this. We have a DNS server, right? Which basically has a table of host names and associated IP addresses, right? And this DHCP server here um, takes host names and assigns IP addresses to them so the DHCP server then has new information about uh, host name and IP address assignments, right? So it would totally make sense for the DHCP server to send that data to the DNS server so that you then can get that information from the DNS server. And to do that, you first need to tell the DNS server to accept such updates. So. I will edit etsy bind name d dot conf dot local. We'll do that for VLAN 2 first. In each zone, you have to configure the setting allow update. And we will require a key for that. Okay. This allows the update. Also allow updates to the reverse lookup zone. Okay, save and I will configure the key itself here in the namedy conf options. So here we now configure key ddns key. Okay, this name must um, be the same that you've used in the zone.
This is very similar to the uh, communication between primary and secondary DHCP server. And I will use random.org again to generate a passphrase for this. Now that the DNS server will allow updates, we can test that. We will need the tool NSUpdate, and that is in the package DNS utils. And now we can um, update the DNS server like this. We can now run ns update. We need to set the server 10.1.2.100. Key, ddns key. We want to update the zone engelmann.local. And yeah, now we can say what we want to change. We want to update, add an entry for uh, victor.engelmann.local, a time to live. Here we have to specify it, let's say 10 minutes. IP protocol, authoritative answer. 192, 168, 178, 40. That's my primary uh, workstation. Okay, uh, before I send this, uh, let me demonstrate that if I try to resolve this now, nothing is found. If I now send this, okay, I figured out what the problem was. There were actually multiple problems. Uh, well, first of all, I hadn't restarted the server, so uh, no wonder it gave me this bad key error message because, uh, yeah, since I hadn't restarted the server, it hadn't loaded the changes in the configuration. So the running server didn't have the password. And yeah, since it didn't know the password, it refused to take the password. Um, so that made sense. Um, but there were more problems. Um, the real big problem was that um, in the file etsy bind name d.conf.local, um, the thing is, when you allow update, um, bind tries to open all your files here, these here, uh, in write mode. And yeah, some of them, this for example, um, were referenced multiple times here, which means that yeah, the server tried to open this file in write mode multiple times at the same time. and. Yeah, that's just something that is just not possible. Um, every operating system will forbid that. Uh, you cannot open the same file uh, in write mode multiple times. It's just not possible. And um, yeah, I solved that by just commenting out all the other views because, um, I mean, I could give different files here for all the reverse lookup zones, but um, yeah, I think that might lead to a situation where you can only see the, um, the DNS entries of your own VLAN, and I don't want that. And uh, in the end, I'm using this whole functionality only to have uh, different IP addresses for one um, host, right? Uh, it was only the Netcore that had different IP addresses in the different um, views, right?
and yeah this one little thing just isn't worth the, um, the all the work to uh, um, to maintain these files multiple times and yeah I've just commented out everything effectively this is now my only view and okay um, I've also um, changed this from to underscore db engelmann.local to db engelmann.local um, so I'm using the core file now as a zone file again okay um, don't save um, but there were more problems than that because the f directory uh, etsy bind zones had the wrong access rights you know I had created that directory and um, I think it had uh, the group root so I had to manually give it the group bind okay because uh, the bind server uh, runs with this group bind and like this um, yeah you can then give access to the files in that directory to the bind server um, by then giving the access rights recursively the access rights group so the group bind gets the access rights read write execute in etsy bind zones okay now sudo system control restart bind 9 okay and now it's running all zones loaded okay so now we can try this again ns update server 10 1 2 100 key ddns dash key zone engelmann dot local and what do I want to do? I want to update it by adding an entry for victor dot engelmann dot local dot the time to live must be explicitly configured here. I find that a bit stupid, but okay. IP address, authoritative answer, 192.168.178.40 is the IP address of my primary workstation. And let's send this. Okay, this is looking good. And now let's try this again. Yes, now we are getting an answer. Okay, so now we see how we can um, update the DNS server. Uh, we now see what happens behind the scenes internally, um, but the DHCP server doesn't yet do that. Okay, so we now also have to configure the DHCP server to uh, send these updates. And how do we do that? Let's see, dhcp, dhcp, d.conf. Okay, so what do we have to set here? Um, the most important thing we need to set is ddns update style to on. Then um, we need to configure the subnet to send updates we do that by setting an option ddns domain name engelmann.local And uh, yeah, then we have to also give it the uh, 
the information about the zones on that server. So we configure a zone, zone engelmann.local. And in here, we configure the server. Uh, since this is running on the same server, I will set this to 127.0.0.1 and specify which key we want to use, the DNS key. And then we have to include that key just the way we've uh, seen it a few times before. Key, DDNS key. Secret password. And the same thing for the reverse lookup zone 1.10.in other.arpa. with the same key. Okay, now let's try this. DNS update style on is a deprecated value. Uh, on doesn't exist anymore. This needs to be standard. Okay. Okay, now it's running. Uh, yeah. That was stupid. Uh, yeah, this, uh, this DDNS domain name, it's not an option. It's uh, a setting for the subnet, so it was just wrong to put option in front of that. Okay. So now the DHCP server is running. Now let's see if we um, can update the DNS server by acquiring a new DHCP lease. Okay, 
disconnect it, reconnect. Connection activated. Okay, it doesn't look like it was updated. Uh, why not? Yeah, probably because it was uh, not a lease, it's a static assignment. Just comment this out. Okay, now let's try again. Ah, it looks like uh, I've gotten the <laughs> IP address from the secondary server, which has not yet been configured to uh, to update the DNS. So let me just stop it so that I cannot get. Uh, a response from that one. Okay, how about now? Yes, now finally we've got a response. Okay, so now the uh, DNS server is finally updated because now I've got the DHCP re response from the correct server. The server has updated the DNS uh, entries. Uh, okay. Okay, so now I am getting an IP address for the laptop. But um, yeah, as you might have already noticed, 1012. something. Um, indicates that I'm in VLAN 2. And yeah, that is actually the case. Uh, the laptop is plugged in on port six right now, which is in VLAN 2. Okay, um, why have I done that? Um, the thing is, if I plug myself into VLAN 4 now, reconnect, you see it's deactivated, but I'm not getting an activated message now, and uh, it keeps trying to connect, but it doesn't succeed. The thing is, I'm in VLAN 4 right now, okay? And the DHCP server is in VLAN 2. I mean, there is a, a router between them, but the thing is that DHCP requests are broadcasts and routers don't forward broadcasts. Okay, and that's really the problem here. You see it's it has failed to uh, get an IP address. Okay, now I'm in VLAN 2 again, and now this works, but um, 
yeah, I don't want the laptop to be in VLAN 2. You know, that's the whole point. I want uh, workstations on VLAN 4 and um, VLAN 2 only for um, devices that control the network, like DHCP server, DNS server, uh, router. I mean, the router has to be in all VLANs, but uh, yeah, anyhow. Um, <laughs> So what can we now do to make the DHCP server give us an IP address even if we are in VLAN 4 and not in VLAN 2? Um, I mean, one thing we could do is we could just give the DHCP server an interface in all VLANs, just like we did with the router. But uh, yeah, if we have a primary and secondary DHCP server, primary and secondary router, all in VLAN, in, in each VLAN, um, plus two unusable <laughs> addresses uh, for every VLAN, the broadcast address and uh, uh, the network address are not usable. So that would already consume six addresses in each VLAN and uh, yeah, that's just a bit wasteful. So of course I could run the DHCP server on the router, then it would have uh, interfaces in all networks, but um, yeah, let's say we have a lot of traffic, then I don't want the, uh, the router to be slowed down by the work it has to do for the DHCP serving. But uh, we can use an, a helper tool called ISC DHCP Relay. Okay, and that is a tool that you run on a router, which picks up DHCP requests, but it doesn't answer them. Okay, it picks them up and forwards them to a different device, and yeah, then uh, we can configure it to forward the requests to the actual DHCP server. And the really cool thing about this is that this DHCP relay um, puts an, a destination IP address of the server on that packet and send that out again so that, um, yeah, once you have an actual recipient for the packet, it's not a broadcast anymore, it's a unicast, and a unicast can be routed, so you can send that wherever you want. You can have it on the other end of the world if you want. Um, yeah, let's configure this. Okay, I have now connected to the netcore, and um, yeah, as I said, I will now install the package ASC DHCP relay. Okay, now it asks for the DHCP servers, and uh, Notice you can uh, specify multiple servers. You have to separate them with a space. So let me just configure 10, 1, 2, 100, space 10, 1, 2, 101. But it also supports host names. That's good. So we can also say dhcp engelmann.local and dhcp2.engelmann.local Okay, which interfaces should the DHCP relay listen on? If we want multiple interfaces, they need to be separated with spaces. So we had ETH 0.2 for VLAN 2, but uh, if we are in VLAN 2 already, then uh, that's the same VLAN that the uh, uh, DHCP server runs on. I don't think that's a good idea to put ETH 0.2 in here. I will put ETH 0.3 and ETH 0.4 in here so that I will forward the packets for uh, VLAN 3 and 4. 
Now it's asking for additional options for the DHCP relay. Now, um, for this, you need to Google ISC DHCP relay and look in the man page for that. This contains all the uh, possible command line options and uh, I want to point out one option specifically and that's the option dash lowercase a. Um, this is a topic that really should be documented better because this is really a central thing that you need because uh, it will put the printable name of the interface into an option of the DHCP request. And that's really an important thing because we need to look at that to distinguish the different VLANs. Okay, we need to know, hey, what interface did the router get this packet on? So that we can then decide which IP range we should pick an IP address from. Okay, so this dash A puts the interface name into the option called circuit ID. Okay, circuit ID, remember that, that's a really important um, agent option um, that we then can uh, examine on the DHCP server. So I will put dash A here. What else do they suggest? Dash M. Okay, that only has to do if you have multiple DHCP um, relays in a row. I don't have that, that doesn't apply to me. And dash D is also only necessary if you um, have multiple DHCP relay agents. Um, yeah. This might be necessary if uh, if we have two routers which both run the DHCP relay. Uh, yeah, I will put it here. Dash D. Okay. Okay. Okay, it says it is running. It has used this command to um, to start the program. You see, we have this dash A, dash D. We have these two interfaces, these two um, DHCP servers. Okay, now on the DHCP server. Um, now we only have one subnet range, right? So I will copy this subnet range and replace this here with uh, 3 with a 24 net mask. IP range from 101.320 to 101.3200. Domain name server is correct. Domain name, DNS domain name. The router in VLAN 3 is 101.3.254. Broadcast ad address is 101.3.255. And the NTP server is 101.2.100. We don't have different NTP servers for different VLANs. Okay, that's for VLAN 3 and for VLAN 4. 10140 with a 24 net mask. OK, 
Okay, so now I have subnets for all the uh, for all the VLANs, and now we need to configure it to distinguish by the VLAN which um, VLAN gets which IP range. So, so here we now set allow members of VLAN three. Down here, allow members of VLAN four. Okay, and for VLAN two, the requests don't come from the router, so we don't have to set anything here. Um, although we might want to uh, specify this in a way so that uh, we don't get confusion. Okay, the problem now is, right now these are just strings. Okay, these are just uh, names for something that we haven't yet specified. Um, we haven't told DHCPD yet um, how to decide if someone is a member of VLAN 2, 3 or 4. And how do we do that? Um, We do that by specifying a class with that name. So these VLANs are now classes and now we need to tell it how do you decide if a request comes from this class. We do that by saying match if and here we now need to put um, an expression like in this DHCP eval. Okay? So we need to um, yeah, read the request in a way and then if it matches our conditions then it will be labeled VLAN 2, 3 or 4 and will then subsequently get an IP address from one of these corresponding IP ranges. So what do we match this with now? The problem here is that uh, this option 82 is not in any way um, standardized. So there are different DHCP relays, different DHCP helpers, and they can send whatever they want. That's not really good. So we need a way first to look at um, this data that we are getting um, to then decide how we want to match that. And I will do that by calling lock uh, option agent dot circuit dash id. Okay, so when the DHCP server now gets a DHCP request, uh, it should lock the content of this circuit id. Okay.
Now let's send a DHCP request and then afterwards look into the log. Connection deactivated. It doesn't look like we are getting a response yet, which makes sense because we haven't told the DHCP server how to determine uh, what VLAN 2, 3, and 4 mean. this again. Since I'm not getting DHCP responses now, I will set this 10, 1, 4, 201, 255, 255, 255, 0, 10, 1, 4, 254, apply. And connect. Now um, let's connect to the DHCP server again. And look into the log and hope that we will see something there. Ah, look. This here was printed by our log statement. So the, um, the data that we are getting as circuit ID is ETH0.4. Good, that is very useful. We can now use that to decide how to uh, set the VLANs. Okay, so now we will use these match if statements. Match if option space agent dot because it's an agent option circuit dash ID equals ETH0.2 um, Yeah, that's actually not what you get in VLAN 2 um, Yeah, in VLAN 3 we have match if option agent dot circuit dash ID equals ETH0.3 Oh, and there needs to be a semicolon. Match if option agent dot circuit ID equals ETH zero four. Okay. So now that we know what data we are getting in this option agent circuit ID. We can comment this out. We don't need to lock that anymore. I will leave it in there for uh, troubleshooting in, uh, in the future if necessary. Hmm. Yeah, how do we decide VLAN 2? I think if it's not VLAN 3 and not Wait, um, there was a, I think there's a better way. Look here, we can test if a certain option is set and if something comes from VLAN 2 directly, then this whole option agent circuit ID just isn't set. So if not exists agent circuit ID.
Okay. So without this agent circuit ID, the request has come directly from VLAN 2 and not passed through the router because the router would have put this option in there. Okay. That seems to make sense. see what happens now when we try to get an IP address. Okay, we are still not getting an IP address apparently. So I will abort this, set this back to manual. Yeah, I think this is um, the request that uh, I've triggered. DHCP request from this MAC address via 10.1.4.254. But it says wrong network because my laptop had this DHCP address before and uh, yeah, now it's not allowed to request that IP from VLAN 4 because that is not in VLAN 4. Therefore, the server sends DHCP not acknowledged. And now we have three times an attempt to get an IP address. The server offers 10.1.4.20 to the laptop through this uh, IP address. And then it tries again. The server tries to give it an IP address. It doesn't reach the laptop, so it asks again. The server tries to send an IP, but it fails, fails, fails. You know. Okay, now looking into the documentation of DHCP relay again. Um, I see this option dash IU, which specifies an upstream interface. And yeah, I think it the problem might be that um, the DHCP relay listens on VLAN 3 and 4 sends the request through VLAN 2, but uh, when the response comes from VLAN 2, maybe um, the DHCP relay doesn't accept that response because uh, it doesn't have an interface on VLAN 2 listening, you know. And I think this upstream interface might be um, might be the option that we need. You see here an interface from which replies will be accepted. So, okay, let's uh, try using that. Um, so this is a net core. So let's see. Again. 
connection was activated. I have an IP address. It's in the 1014 range. <laughs> Do I have a router? Yeah, it's going through Netcore to the Fritz box and then out into the internet. Yes. Uh, okay, it's working. <laughs> it's finally working. <laughs> okay, so that was a problem. <laughs> Uh, that was a lot of work, I can tell you, because this is really not so well documented and uh, there aren't really many good discussions about the topic on the internet, um, at least not for the combination of ISC DHCP server and ISC DHCP relay using multiple VLANs. So uh, that was really more complicated than it has any right to be. But uh, yeah, anyhow, I'm just happy that it works now. And uh, uh, yeah, if you like this video, like it, share it, subscribe, and see you next time.